The Greek and Roman myths have inspired everything from great art and literature to our notions of sexuality and gender roles. Hi, Ed Leon here for The Great Courses. Classical mythology, taught by award-winning professor Elizabeth Vandiver, introduces you to the lead characters and most important stories of classical Greek and Roman mythology in a fresh, absorbing, and often surprising way. Myths give us a great deal of insight on what a specific culture thinks about the nature of the world in general and about key elements within the world. You'll cover important basics like what is a myth, which societies use myths, and some of the problems inherent in studying classical mythology. And you'll explore fascinating topics like how mythological depictions of women represent Greek males' anxiety about female power, the extensive influence of Ovid's metamorphosis on the works of William Shakespeare and how that affected English literature, and the differences between the classical notion of gods and our concepts of what God should be. From Athena to Zeus to the most famous of all classical myths, the Trojan War. Find out where mythology came from and how it affects our life and culture today. Classical Mythology with Professor Elizabeth Vandiver. Order it now from The Great Courses. These lectures are part of the Great Courses on Tape series. The Great Courses on Tape cover a broad array of university-level disciplines. The lectures in each course are either 30 or 45 minutes long. By listening for less than an hour a day, you can finish even the longest course in just weeks. Browse our catalog or website and imagine how much you could learn if you spent just 30 minutes a day for the next year in the best college classrooms in the world. The lecturers are university professors carefully selected by the teaching company and its customers for intellectual distinction and teaching excellence. The lectures on these tapes are titled Classical Mythology, Part 1. The lecturer is Professor Elizabeth Vandiver. Dr. Vandiver teaches classics at the University of Maryland at College Park. After receiving her MA and PhD from the University of Texas at Austin, she held visiting professorships at Northwestern University, the University of Georgia, the Intercollegiate Center for Classical Studies in Rome, Loyola University of New Orleans, and Utah State. Professor Vandiver has published Heroes in Herodotus, The Interaction of Myth and History, and is currently working on a second book examining the influence of the classical tradition on the British poets of the First World War. In 1998, Dr. Vandiver received the American Philological Association's Excellence in Teaching Award, the most prestigious teaching award available to American classical scholars. Her other awards include the Northwestern University Department of Classics Excellence in Teaching Award for 1998 and the University of Georgia's Outstanding Honors Professor Award in 1993 and 1994. Each of Dr. Vandiver's lectures is outlined in the course guide that comes with these tapes. The course guide also includes a glossary, timeline, biographical notes, and bibliography. You may find it useful to review the outlines before and after listening to the lectures. Lecture 1, Introduction. and welcome to this course on classical mythology. My name is Elizabeth Vandiver. I teach classics, that's Latin and Greek language, culture, history, and literature at the University of Maryland. And in these 24 lectures, I'm going to be talking to you about the mythology of classical society. In this introductory lecture, there are three main things I want to accomplish. I want to start by defining some terms, classical, mythology, and most importantly and most difficultly, myth itself. Then I want to look at some of the problems and difficulties inherent in 
studying classical mythology. And finally, briefly, at the end of the lecture, I want to describe the approach I'm going to take to the course, what I'm going to do with these lectures as we look at classical mythology. So to start with definitions, what do we mean by classical mythology? The term classical in this context refers to the cultures of ancient Greece and Rome. Now, those are two separate cultures, separated from one another not only by location in Italy and Greece, and by language, the Romans spoke Latin, the Greeks spoke Greek, understandably enough, but also separated from one another by time in regards to their high points. Greek culture reached its high point in Athens in the fifth century BC. Roman culture hit its zenith in the first centuries BC and AD. So there's a gap of several hundred years between the high points of these two civilizations. And yet we talk about their mythology as a single unit, classical mythology. We can do that because while there are two separate cultures, there's a strong relationship between the two in their literature, their art, and particularly in their mythology. Roman culture borrowed or perhaps adapted would be a better term, a great deal of its mythology wholesale from Greek culture. Therefore, the myths that developed in ancient Greece were taken over by the ancient Romans, and this makes it possible to discuss not just Greek mythology or Roman mythology, but classical mythology as a unified whole. In this course, I'll probably find myself using the terms Greek myth and classical myth more or less interchangeably simply because the myths did originate in Greece and were later adapted by the Romans. And in a lecture near the end of the course, we'll look specifically at what the Romans did with Greek myth when they adapted it. So, so much for classical. What about mythology? Well, the term mythology is actually rather ambiguous. Strictly speaking, it ought to mean the study of myth. The ology ending means study of, just as biology is the study of life, psychology is the study of the mind, uh, geology is the study of the earth. Mythology ought to mean the study of myth. And in fact, some scholars do use it that way. Properly speaking, that's what it ought to mean. And yet, in common usage, mythology tends to mean the whole body of myths told by a particular culture. If someone says to you, I've been reading a lot of Norse mythology recently, you don't assume that they mean they've been reading theoretical statements about the myths of Norse culture or that they've been reading examinations of those myths. You tend to assume that they mean they have been reading an anthology of Norse myths. So Mythology has these two separate meanings, the study of myth and simply the whole body of myth developed within any particular culture. I'll use the, terms in, the term in both ways in these lectures. We are doing mythology in the first sense. We're studying myth, but I'll also frequently refer to classical mythology or Greek mythology, meaning the body of myths developed in those cultures. Okay, now for the difficult one. If mythology is either the study of myth or the whole body of myth developed by a culture, well then, what is myth? That is a question that has no easy or obvious answer. The attempt to define myth is very, very difficult. Myth is a notoriously hard concept to define, as we'll see in detail in the next two lectures where we look at several theories about myth. For this lecture, I want to give you a basic working definition to start with, a definition that I've worked out over years of teaching classical mythology to college students. I define myth as a working definition to start with. I define myth as traditional stories a society tells itself that encode or represent the worldview, beliefs, principles, and often the fears of that society. Now, every single term in that definition could be argued with. There are scholars who would disagree with every one of them. But just as a working definition to start with, it's, I think, useful. Myths, in my definition, are traditional stories or traditional tales. Right away, that needs a little fine-tuning. Many scholars subdivide traditional tales in any society into three subcategories, myth, legend, and folktale. In that division, myth, myth proper, as it's sometimes called, would refer 
only to stories that have to do directly with the gods. So a story about Zeus's rise to power would be a myth in this threefold division. A story about Oedipus, Odysseus, Achilles would not be because they're humans, not gods. In this threefold division, legend would refer to traditional stories rooted in historical fact describing adventures of people who once actually lived but whose adventures have been greatly exaggerated through the passage of time. Robin Hood would be an example of a legend. Uh, taking a more recent example closer to home, George Washington is starting to accrue all sorts of legendary stories around him. There's no doubt that there was an actual George Washington and yet many of the stories we tell about him, such as chopping down the cherry tree, throwing a silver dollar across the river, those sorts of exploits have more to do with the symbolic function that we want George Washington to fulfill in our society than with anything that the historical man George Washington actually did. Given enough centuries, he could become purely legendary. The third division, folktale, would refer to stories that are primarily entertaining and that often involve animals, very frequently talking animals, or clever human beings but not exceptional human beings, common people who are particularly clever in one way or another. Folktale is often referred to also as fairy tale, though that's rather a misleading term since these stories don't normally have anything to do with fairies whatsoever. But an example of folktale would be Little Red Riding Hood, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, that kind of thing. Now, these three categories of traditional tales, these subdivisions into myth, legend, and folktale, are useful. They can sometimes be very helpful in determining exactly what kind of a story we're dealing with, but at least in classical mythology, these categories overlap to such an extent that the distinctions seem rather artificial. We have stories in classical mythology that combine elements of all three, myth, legend, and folktale. Some of the most Famous works of classical literature, for instance, the Iliad and the Odyssey, are impossible to categorize in this system as either myth or legend because they partake of elements of both. So in this course, we'll be looking at traditional stories that would count as legend according to this scheme, and we'll even see several examples of at least folktale elements within the traditional stories that we look at. And I tend to use myth as a wider category to account for all three types of traditional stories. Well, if myths are traditional tales or stories that a society tells itself about itself, then the next question must be which societies use myth and why do they use it? All societies have myths. They seem to be a given of human culture. I don't think there's ever been a society that did not have some sort of traditional stories, traditional tales. But myth has an importance in pre-literate cultures that it has lost in modern, highly literate, highly technological Western culture. I say pre-literate, by the way, rather than illiterate, because illiterate always sounds pejorative to me. It sounds like it implies that the culture ought to know how to read and write and is just too lazy to have managed that technology yet. Pre-literate seems more accurate because it indicates more precisely the status of the culture. The culture may be very sophisticated but has not yet developed writing. In a pre-literate culture, myth has an importance that it does not have in a literate culture. The reason for that, I think, is that in literate culture, we have all sorts of different forms of explanation, of analysis, different windows for looking at the world and human experience that have developed after the invention of writing. For instance, we have psychology, we have theology, we have history, we have science. We have a whole cornucopia of approaches if we want to ask ourselves questions such as why does the world work as it works, why are physical entities as they are, how can human beings get along better together, why are there two sexes, why do the two sexes have so much trouble getting along with one another. Those sorts of questions we can approach through any one of a number of avenues. Take that last one. In our culture, if we want to ask ourselves why is it that men and women have such a hard time getting along together, we can turn to psychology. 
We can turn to biology, to science. We can, if we like, turn to theology. We have all sorts of avenues of looking at, exploring, discussing, analyzing that kind of question. But in a preliterate society, what means do they have for discussing such issues if they don't have a sophisticated long-lived literate tradition out of which these different disciplines can grow what do they have the answer is they have traditional tales or if you like myth in other words in a pre-literate society all the functions that these different ologies and osophies that I've just talked about have to fulfill must be fulfilled in a pre-literate society only by traditional tales Students often look very surprised when I say that, but if you think about it for a moment, I think you'll see that it's so. How can a culture that doesn't have writing pass down its belief system, its values, its traditions, its history, its view of the world, its view about the gods, about humans? The only open means is traditional word of mouth, repeated knowledge handed down from one generation to the next, and that knowledge is almost always put in the form of stories probably for ease of remembering it and thinking about it. Now, this has important implications for the question that I'm very frequently asked in the classroom of what does myth really mean? In modern Western, or at least modern American culture, we tend to make a very strong distinction between fact and fiction, true and false, real and imaginary, uh, that sort of thing, literal and metaphorical, and that is, in fact, one of the main analytical tools we use for thinking about anything. It's one of the first things we ask of any story. Most of our stories come to us now, to most of us, through televisions and movies rather than through books. But that doesn't matter. One of the first things we ask about any story is, is this true or is it fiction? Is this biography or is it a novel? One of the reasons that so many people were uncomfortable with the recent movie Titanic, I think, is because it blended fact and fiction in a way that we found uncomfortable. It was a very detailed factual reenactment of the sinking of the Titanic, but it incorporated into that factual reenactment a completely fictional story, and we're uncomfortable with that. We don't know how to deal with that sort of story. But in a culture in which traditional tales are the only available form of explanation, analysis, thinking about reality, if you want to put it that way, these distinctions can't be anything like so clear-cut. The question, what does this myth really mean? What does this story really mean? Becomes anything but simple. Let me give you an example of that from Greek myth itself. In lecture four, we'll start talking about the creation story of the Greeks as told by an author named Hesiod. And in that story, we'll encounter two entities named Gaia and Uranus. Gaia is a goddess. Uranus is a god. They have volition. They have desires. They have speech. They can mate with one another, produce children. They are anthropomorphized, human-like entities, female and male. And yet, Gaia is simply a word that means earth. Uranus is simply a word that means sky. Gaia is the earth. If you go outside and stamp your foot on the ground, you're stamping on Gaia. Uranus is the sky. All you have to do to see him is go outside and look up. Students very frequently in my classes will raise their hands and say, well, which is Gaia really? Is she really the earth or is she really a goddess with arms, legs, mind, speech, etc.? And I answer, it infuriates them, but I answer, yes because that's the only possible answer. She is really both of those things. The distinction that we tend to make between metaphorical and literal simply is not there. Now, a side point here. We do sometimes tend still to speak in metaphor. Several years ago, I was watching a television program about protesters who are protesting logging in the redwood forests in the, in the West. And I remember vividly one protester who was chained to a redwood tree saying, we have abused Mother Nature shamelessly and she will take her revenge. That sounds on the surface 
like the same sort of thing that you see with Gaia in Greek myth. And yet I think all of us recognize that as a metaphor. We don't think there is actually an entity called Mother Nature out there who is looking at human beings and saying, I'm going to get those little creeps for what they've done to me. We recognize this as a metaphorical way of saying we have damaged our own environment and we will suffer for it. Now, the metaphor still has much more emotive value than the, the purely literal statement, but we recognize it as a metaphor. It would be a mistake, I think, to assume that Hesiod and his audience, when Hesiod talks about Gaia and Uranus, felt it as a metaphor in the same way. I'm quite sure they did not. Gaia was a goddess at the same time that she was the Earth. Now, Greek mythology, like other mythologies, developed in a preliterate culture. And this means that when we set out to study Greek mythology or classical mythology, we are setting ourselves a very paradoxical task. It developed in a preliterate culture, but how do we know about it? What do we study when we study Greek myth? We study it through literature. We have to. That's our only access to it, or our main access to it, is through literature. Modern scholars of myth very frequently turn to modern preliterate societies to try to figure out what myth is and how it works. The anthropological approach to myth is one of the most fruitful ones in the modern field of theoretical myth study. In the anthropological approach, scholars go into living cultures, talk to living representatives of those cultures, write down what different representatives tell them about their myths, get a sense of how myth works in its na native habitat, so to speak. They can study myth as a living element of a living culture. When we talk about classical myth, when we want to look at the myth of the ancient Greeks and Romans, in effect, we're trying to do anthropology backwards in time. We're trying to do anthropolo anthropological observation on a culture that has no living representatives. This is a very frustrating and very difficult task. Obviously, I think it's worth undertaking, but there are some difficulties and problems inherent in it that we need to bear in mind throughout this course. What are our sources for doing this backwards in time anthropology? Most obviously, literature the literary works that have survived from ancient Greece and Rome that recount or refer to the myths of those cultures. And to supplement literature, archaeology comes into the picture. We can look at archaeological artifacts, rem remnants of buildings, um, artwork, that sort of thing. But both of these, literature and archaeology, present formidable problems for trying to reconstruct what Greek and Roman myth was in its living environment. First of all, let's think about literature. Even in as well-documented and well-studied a society as classical Greece, the written versions of myths involve several problems for a scholar of myth. First of all, most obviously, written myths are frozen. By that I mean that once a version of a myth is written down, it's fixed. There it is. And we literate people have a strong tendency to assume that that means that version is somehow the myth, the real myth, the only way the myth was ever told. But that's not how traditional tales work in any oral setting. If I asked every one of you watching this lecture to tell me the story of Little Red Riding Hood, I would get as many slightly different versions as there are people watching this lecture. That's how a living oral tradition works. Once a story is written down, when our only access to it is through writing, we tend to assume that's the real story. I can give a very clear example of what I mean by this. Everyone knows the story of Oedipus the king, how he killed his father, married his mother without knowing who they were. When he, discover, <coughs> excuse me, when he discovered the terrible thing that he had done, after his mother hanged herself, Oedipus blinded himself, went into exile, never returned home to Thebes again, right? Well, right according to Sophocles, who wrote the play Oedipus the King. In Homer, in the Odyssey, there's a very brief reference to Oedipus, which agrees that, yes, he killed his father and married his mother. Yes, his mother killed herself after the truth came out. But Oedipus, says Homer, continued to rule at Thebes for many years thereafter. Which is the real version of the Oedipus myth? They both are. Sophocles' version 
dominates our understanding of the myth because it is such a marvelous play and because it's so famous. And this is the kind of thing we have to guard against. Often we have only one version of a myth. We have to remember that there probably were others. Another problem in studying myth through literature is that myths were the givens of the society, were something that everybody knew. And so very frequently authors will make the briefest possible allusion to a myth without explaining what it means or who it is. I did this a few minutes ago when I referred to George Washington. I didn't have to tell you who George Washington was, tell you when he was born, when he died, what he did, who he married, where he lived, you know all that. He's a given of our society. A scholar 2,500 years from now, in the future, if all the references that scholar had to George Washington were equally elliptical to what I just said, it would be very difficult to reconstruct who George Washington was, what he did, and why he was important. So that's another difficulty in approaching myth through literature. Another problem is that only a fraction of ancient Greek literature has survived. Most of what was written is now lost. And often the things that survive do not tell us what we would particularly like to know. They weren't written for us, so they don't give us the details that would be most helpful to us. One book we will use a great deal in this, cult, in this course is called The Library of Greek Mythology. It was written by a man named Apollodorus, about whom we know absolutely nothing except that he wrote this book. He lived in the first or second century A.D., probably, and he compiled brief summaries of all the myths he knew at a time when some of those myths were starting to fragment or be forgotten. So that's very useful for us. We'll use Apollodorus as a source book, but even there we have to remember that he's giving usually only one or at most two versions of myths and that there may have been myths he chose not to recount or didn't know and there may have been other versions of the ones he did recount. So much for literature. What about archaeology? The archaeological record and literature can often shed light on one another, but archaeology is, if anything, even more difficult to use as a reconstruction of myth than literature is. An archaeological artifact by itself tells us little or nothing about a myth to which it may refer. A statue, a painting, if we do not already know the stories on which those are based, we cannot extrapolate the stories simply from the artifacts themselves. The same is true for buildings. If we know that a building was a temple in honor of a particular god, we may be able to come up with some idea of what went on in that building, how that particular god was honored. But if we don't have external, and that in, in the case of an ancient culture means written evidence to explain the archaeology, the archaeology itself can often be close to incomprehensible. There's a joke among classical archaeologists that when an archaeologist has no idea what an object is for, he or she will say it is of clear ritual significance. Uh, if we don't know what something was, it must have been used in a ritual. That really explains nothing. And that's a problem that we come up against in archaeology over and over again, not knowing what things were for, not knowing the stories behind images. We can also be misled by references in literature to thinking that we know what an archaeological artifact or building was for when actually we don't. Let's imagine for a moment that we are archaeologists 2,500 years in the future excavating some great American city, Washington, D.C. will do, and that we have, as remnants of English language literature, several of the novels of Dickens, two or three of Jane Austen's novels, Huckleberry Finn, and let's say eight volumes of the 1925 Encyclopedia Britannica, including the volume G. Okay? As we excavate Washington, D.C., we come across all sorts of small buildings, each one laid out on the same plan, and each one with large, clearly ritually significant golden arches in front of it. Well, we've read our Dickens and our Jane Austen, We've got volume G of the Encyclopedia Britannica. We know that Gothic cathedrals and churches featured arches. It's a little bit disconcerting that our one American novel, Huckleberry Finn, doesn't say anything about these little Gothic churches, but Mark Twain wasn't a very religious man, perhaps, or he just wasn't interested in something everybody already knew. So there you have it. McDonald's were Gothic churches. Now, that's a silly example, perhaps, but I think it's also an illustrative example because very frequently the written record is no closer a match to the archaeological record than that.
we can think we know what we're looking at when in actuality we're looking at something entirely and completely different, but we have no way of knowing that. So where does this leave us? Is this a hopeless endeavor? Should we just give up at this point and say there's no way to study classical mythology? Obviously, I don't think so. But I think we need to bear these difficulties in mind as we start our survey of classical mythology. We need to remember that we are studying only particular variants of the myths. Sometimes we can reconstruct a fairly full version of how the myth must have operated in its original society when we have all sorts of variants to work from. Other times we can't. Other times we'll have only one version of a myth and no others. Some references remain tantalizingly obscure. Sometimes we really just don't know what a character's name or what a snippet of a story refers to. Occasionally, a work of art preserves what is clearly a very different version from the only ones known to us by literature. There's a beautiful classical Greek painting, vase painting, of a character who is quite clearly Jason, Jason who, who got the Golden Fleece after his voyage on the Argo. The Golden Fleece is there on a tree behind Jason. The tree is guarded by a dragon. All of these elements point to the fact that this is very clearly Jason. And yet, in this painting, the dragon is either swallowing Jason or is spitting him back out again. Jason is halfway out of the dragon's mouth. His arms and head are visible outside the dragon's mouth. In no written version of Jason's story that has, that has survived for us does the dragon eat Jason or attempt to eat Jason. The whole point is that Jason is helped by Medea, who gives him magic potions so that he can overcome the dragon without being eaten. If this vase painting had not survived, we would not know that there had ever been a variant in which Jason was eaten by the dragon. Because we have the painting, we know this variant existed, but that's all we know about it. We have no written description of that version of Jason's story. So we can't recover all the versions of a myth. We also probably can't ever know all the nuances, all the resonances of that myth within its own society. Again, when I say George Washington, that brings up all sorts of associations in our mind. Grade school, plays. I played George Washington when I was six years old in the grade school play. Um, the Fourth of July, bands, John Philip Sousa marches. All of those things are there as kinds of free associations with the name George Washington. That kind of nuance, that kind of resonance is unrecoverable. We're not going to know that in all its detail, probably about any culture other than our own. But within these limitations, we can use what we know about classical society to shed light on its mythology, and we can use what we know about the myths to shed light on the society. So, what I want to conclude with in this lecture very briefly is describing what I'm planning to do in this course, how I'm planning to organize the lectures. There are three main points to the course. First of all, most simply, the lectures will provide you with familiarity with the primary classical myths that are covered by the course. Now, this is by no means a survey of all classical myth or even of all important classical myth. I've had to leave a very great deal out. But what I've tried to do is pick representative important myths that will give you a good taste of classical mythology and the course will familiar familiarize you with at least some of the major characters, themes, and stories of classical myth. So most lectures will include some synopsis of the relevant myths storyline. And that will frequently mean discussing different versions versions, variants of the myth, when we have them, and discussing the implications of those variants for our understanding of how the myths work. The essential readings for each lecture will normally be taken from classical literature, very frequently from Apollodorus, the library of Greek myth, which I mentioned earlier. Second, the lectures will discuss the cultural aspects of these myths as they functioned in the culture that developed them. That is, we'll look at the myths within the context of ancient Greek and ancient Roman culture. And I'll talk about what the myths tell us about the belief systems of those cultures, what those cultures tell us about the meanings of the myth, that sort of thing. Finally, we'll consider, at least in many of the lectures, how well, or perhaps how poorly, the myths we're looking at match various theories about myth as a category, about myth with a capital M, and we'll discuss the usefulness of various theories and theoretical approaches for our understanding of classical mythology. So in this lecture, we've sketched out a working definition of what myth is. We've talked about some of the difficulties of studying classical mythology, 
And in our next lecture, we'll move on to continue our discussion of what myth is and how it works by beginning our examination of several of the most influential theories about myth and its function.